welcome to Sugarly Shed Mark II. Uh, I don't know when I'll stop calling it Mark II and just call it the Sugarly Shed. Um, but it still feels new and Mark II-ish. So, Mark II. Uh, this episode is going to be on the electric and power supply to the shed. Uh, I know a few people have kind of asked me questions and things, so hopefully this will cover all the questions that you would like answers to. Uh, I'm going to get power put into the shed at the end of this week by a qualified electrician. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but the rest of the wiring I'm going to do myself. So, consumer unit for my house is in there. And I've dug a trench along here that goes all the way around the side to the shed. Um, it's, it's kind of getting dark just now so you can't see it so well but essentially there will be a steel wall armour cable laid in that trench going into the shed and that'll power it. Now uh, it's a bit of a grey area I think but um, my reading of the rules uh, in Britain anyway or at least in Scotland is that uh, putting a new cable from the consumer unit to the shed and a new consumer unit at the shed uh, is basically work the it goes out with the scope of a DIYer, I think. Um, I might be wrong, but either way, uh, I'm, I'm going to get a qualified electrician to lay that steel wall armoured cable. Um, there's a few things that really, really need to be done properly. The glanding and stuff like that is all stuff that I think is a bit more complicated. So that will kind of... I think it's wise just to get a proper electrician in to do that part of it and connect up the consumer unit. And then... Um, I think the rest of the regs only really say that a competent person can then do the rest of the wiring. Uh, how do you deem yourself competent? I don't know. If I can wire a motorbike, maybe I can wire my shed. So I'm, I'm self-certifying that I'm competent. Um, but either way, uh, my electrician will get to sign off my work as well. So that's hopefully uh, covering all the safety aspects of it. Um, and the rest of it, I guess, is just trying to follow regulations with regards to what stuff I use and the size of the cables and the fittings and things. So first up, I've got these LED strip lights. Uh, they're really easy to install. There's just these wee brackets you screw in and then they just kind of fit in. And then uh, there's little bits here for where you wire them in. Oh, shit. I just moved it. So I've got one, two, Three, one above the workbench and then two basically above the kind of main bulk of the workshop. Uh, that way, hopefully we've got enough light on the workbench and enough light here. It wouldn't be too much work to wire in an extra light over here if I need to in the future. Uh, so I'm not too worried about that. Next up is the socket arrangement. Uh, so I've got three sockets above the workbench here. And then I also have one hiding in the corner over here for, for example, plugging in anything when I'm working outside. So I could plug in an extension cable and uh, work outside a bit easier. Uh, and then also over here, I've got uh, for the light switch, and then I'm also gonna wire in a fused spur um, for a lathe when I get one. So I'll be able to plug the lathe straight into there and turn it off and on at the wall, rather than having it just be run through a regular socket. These are the face plates for the sockets. Basically, this is called a metal clad socket. So as you can see, it's clad fully in metal as opposed to a plastic one. The reason you use metal clad sockets in sheds and workshops is just because uh, if they get damaged, it's obviously a safety issue. So the metal ones are a bit more robust. So, you know, if something falls over and knocks into one, it's not going to smash it and uh, give me an electric shock. So now that I've installed the lights and the socket positions and the light switch position, uh, I really need to just sort of hook them all up. So that's uh, wiring them all in and I'm going to run it all surface uh, through conduit. And the reason I'm doing that and I didn't do like a first fix by putting all the cables behind the boarding is if I want to reconfigure anything in the future, like move sockets about, uh, it's, it's not that big a job. You just rerun the conduit, move the things about um, if I find that this layout isn't, you know, is, is suboptimal or something like that. Uh, so that's kind of my thought process with regards to that. I've got a bunch of 20 mil conduit and a bunch of connectors and elbows and T-joints and stuff. So I kind of need to just start fixing uh, the brackets to hold those on, the conduit saddles, put the conduit up, run cables through it, connect the cables up to the sockets. And then really it should be a case of connecting those cables to the consumer unit. And then we have power as of Thursday when I get it installed. 
So it's not too big a job, but I've not actually wired a, like a house circuit and like a ring circuit or anything like that before. Um, so it's a bit of a learning curve, but uh, I don't think it's too complicated. We can figure it out. Essentially, what I'm going to do is fix these to the wall. I think they need to be 40 centimeter intervals. Uh, that's sort of standard for Britain, I think. Um, so I need to fix these in position and fix the joints and then hook them all up with conduit. Uh, and the elbows and T joints have pla uh, plates that you can unscrew, so it helps with feeding the cables around the corners. We have vertical conduit running to everything. Next thing to do is fit top pieces to these uh, and then cross pieces to link them all up. kind of ran out of time last night so I'm back in this morning uh, just for an hour before I have to go out uh, and as you can see BJ Brickhouse Bills will be very pleased to see that I am back in my bright yellow winter jacket and um, it's cold this morning so I'll be uh, glad to get this place finished up. I left it last night with the conduits running along the top for the sockets uh, I rejigged this one slightly um, just to make things a bit neater. Uh, next thing I need to do is run conduit to the strip lights, um, but I actually ran out of conduit. Um, I've only got little bits, I haven't got any long enough lengths to do that properly. Uh, and I also ran out of the saddle clip thing, so I've only got one left. So I'm going to need to order some more of them before I can get on with the majority of the rest of the work. But seeing as the sockets are, uh, the socket conduit is all in place, I'm going to start running um, 2.5mm twin and earth cable through them. I'm also going to run a 6mm cable um, to the spur socket for the lathe. Um, just, I don't know if it's strictly necessary, but it's slightly heavier duty cable, and I know that lathe motors do pull quite a lot of current, so just for safety's sake. said, let there be light. Woo! We have lights. We also have power to the sockets. The shed is electrified. I actually had to get a new SD card for my GoPro because uh, the other one got corrupted and I lost a bit of footage. Uh, so just to fill in some gaps for you, uh, I'll talk you through what I ended up going for with regards to the electric setup. So starting at the door, I have the light switch. I also have a redundant light switch here. I'm not sure whether or not I might want more lights at some point. So I put I fit a double one here. And um, so in future I can maybe wire in some extra lights if I want them. 
I also have a fused spur which I'm going to wire um, a lathe into at some point just so that it's basically an off on at the wall rather than a, a plugged in socket, a bit neater. Uh, I've got them running in conduit up to roof level and then it's just exposed cable. Um, I think this is actually satisfactory. The, the only guidelines around conduit basically say that conduit should be used where there's a risk of the cable being damaged. So round about here, I guess there is risk. And again, above the work bench, there's risk of it being damaged, but up there, there isn't really risk of it being damaged. And not only that, but stuffing that amount of cable into conduit doesn't give it breathing space. And there is a very uh, slim chance of cables overheating. So I think this is the best solution. I've tried to be as neat as I can with regards to running it around the top with cable clips, etc. I might even paint it all white just to make it all blend in. So I've got a double socket on this side of the door if I want to plug things in that I'm taking outside. I've got a double socket there, there and there to cover the whole of the workbench. I'm hoping to have my pillar drill, bench grinder and things plugged in here. And then over there is uh, just, you know, when I'm using things and likewise over there. And then lights, I've got three LED strip lights, one here, one here and one here. Hopefully these two will cover the bulk of what I'm working on. And then this one covers the workbench. I said earlier I might want to fit more lights at some point, possibly under this shelf to light this area of workbench a little bit better. Um, but you know, that's that's something that I might do in the future if I feel like I need it. Then in the store, we have a light as well up here to light the mountain bikes and things. And then this is the consumer unit that I've had fitted by Monroe Electrical Services. Thank you very much for doing that. Uh, they've run this steel wall armoured cable that runs along, down, and then it's uh, I've lifted the slabs and dug it. So it runs through a trench into my consumer unit in my house. And then over here, we've got four breakers. Uh, the circuits are on the 32, the lights are on the 6. I have a spare 6 and a spare 16, which is probably going to be upgraded to something a bit stronger, which is the one I'll put the lathe into. Uh, but I don't really need to do that until I get a lathe. Aside from that, nice solid steel unit. Locks nicely, neatly on this board. Light switch for in here, and then the cables are just running in from up there. Not as pretty here, but again, you know, they're all out of the way, which is what I'm happy about. I guess that concludes the electrics installation. Uh, it was a bit of a complicated one, and I had to sort of use my brain a little bit with regards to the neatest way of putting the cables around the place. Uh, it wasn't quite as straightforward as I was thinking it was going to be, just running conduit and things like that. And so I had to do a little bit of thinking, but got there in the end. And like my electrician said when I asked him whether or not I could wire my shed, he you know, said, if you can build and wire a motorbike, you can wire a shed. It's not complicated. Um, it's just a few different ways to do it. Uh, and the most important thing is doing it properly so that it's safe. Uh, you know, sleeving all your earths and not leaving any exposed cores and things like that when you're putting all the sockets together or putting things on securely and straight it's all these things you, you know any monkey can make a, a a circuit work but can you make it work safely which is the, the the thing i really tried to concentrate on here you may also have noticed that the workshop is a complete tip because i've started moving stuff in i have a, a video about that coming up uh, i did treat myself to a lovely tool cabinet which will need to get filled up uh, I also picked up this uh, record vice, um, pretty old school, but it's totally solid. It's also one of the quick release ones, so you can like drag it out and push it in. I've not secured it to the bench yet, but I will do that. Uh, it needs a bit of a clean up, maybe a wee coat of paint, but aside from that, really pleased with that. Total bargain, Facebook Marketplace. And then the big spender was what's inside this crate here. And uh, I think you probably guess what's in there, but I will do an unboxing of that and show you it all being assembled at some point. Eagle-eyed viewers will also have noticed this Royal Enfield Continental GT535. This is Mrs. Shugley's new bike. Uh, it's covered in mud because my two-year-old climbed all over it with muddy boots on. But there are some things I want to do to this and I'll should do some videos on that as well. Hopefully I want to switch out the clip-on bars for riser bars. Basically make it into like a sort of miniature interceptor. That's the sort of idea. Uh, anyway, more about that later. And then my XS250 is over there. Got some things in the pipeline planned for that too. And that's where I'm going to wrap this episode. 
I hope you enjoyed it. It was a bit of a broken up one, to be honest, because of my technical issues. But hopefully it all made sense. Uh, it's not intended to be a how-to on how to wire your shed, so please don't, uh, don't hold me to anything. Disclaimer, I'm not an electrician. And uh, yeah, if you want to wire your own shed, maybe get some advice from a qualified electrician and not some random dude on YouTube. Uh, which is definitely not where I got a lot of my advice from. Anyway, as usual, please do like and subscribe to the Sugarly Shed channel. Uh, it's really important and like I say every time, I will love you forever if you do it. I am closing in on a thousand subscribers, uh, which is the, the big number that YouTube holds you to. So uh, yeah, if you haven't yet, please do subscribe and get me over that line. Uh, I will be forever grateful. And I shall see you in the next episode when hopefully we'll be unboxing this big wooden crate. See you then. Bye. And the Lord said, let there be light. And the Lord said, let there be light.